I don't know how people really exist without collecting. How do they procrastinate? Siemens, development assistant with the American Philatelic Society. It is my pleasure to talk with Mark Swakala today, director of the fi documentary film Freaks and Heirs, a rare collection. I'm excited to discuss his connection to philately and unpack the making of the film. So welcome, Mark. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> really uh, happy to be here. Awesome. Um, so I'd like to start off by asking you what attracted you to stamp collecting and what really inspired making a film about it? Um, I think what really attracted me to the, to the idea of doing a film about stamp collecting is that no one had ever done it before. I mean, I had seen a lot of little snippets and little videos people have done about individual collectors, but I don't, I didn't really see anything that um, looked at stamp collecting as a whole, as not just, um, not just the stamps, but the people and the industry behind it. So I felt like this was a great opportunity to um, tell the story of stamps and stamp collectors to a wider audience, not just philatelists who usually will watch anything about stamps. So I tried to really find a, um, a way to create a film that people could watch in regards of what they collect and kind of see something about themselves and, and these collectors. Very cool, very cool. So when it comes to stamp collecting, I, I know that many collect, collection, or collectors talk about the hunt for the stamps, right? So how did you leverage this understanding to find people to talk with? I don't think it's, I think if you're a collector, it's not that you are all about your collection, you don't really wanna talk about. Most people do wanna talk about that. A lot of times they wanna to talk to other collectors because I think they don't think that anybody else understands their passion and their love and their interest in what they collect. So when I first kind of put the world out there or the word out there to um, find people to uh, interview, I, there was not a lot of people really wanted to be interviewed, which was a little disheartening. So it took me a little bit longer to connect with people who would then let me know about other people who would be interested in talking. So I really, I relied on the stamp community to then throw their feelers out there and then come back with people who would be willing to talk about uh, their collection but also their collecting habits and letting me into their, their lives and telling me you know, personal anecdotes about them, their lives. And so I think it's, in general, it's a really difficult thing to ask somebody to do because you're invading their kind of personal space. So it did really take the entire stamp community to help me get involved in more collectors. This is the broken crown. This is the, that right there is the stamp that sort of started the whole thing off, you know? Why? Because the crown's missing. Half the crown's cut off. Seems basic, seems simple, but for some reason that set this whole thing in motion, you know? So from what was one page of stamps, you know, it turned into book after book after book. And I'm not stopping anytime soon. This was the, the Broken Crown, which is, uh, was the first sort of major error to be discovered on these stamps. What is interesting, as I said earlier, about how different printings of stamps were different colors. What makes this really fun is that we know there were three printings of the one penny. So the first printing was this sort of regular brown color, and there's the broken crown. So we know it appeared on the first printing. The second printing was this sort of reddish brown color, and there's the broken crown. So we know it was still on the second printing, but this is where it gets really cool. This is the third printing, it's the dark brown, exactly the same position. This stamp is exactly the same position, the crown's been fixed. So now we know that at some point between that printing and that printing, they fixed it. That's awesome. The idea of stamps is that they were the introduction to the world and that great men, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a stamp collector. It's fascinating, intriguing. Um, sharing those personal stories about your collection and hobbies is obviously very personal. Um, so how were you able to make people feel comfortable enough to share them? Like, do you have a secret that we don't know about? <laughs> I, wish, I, I wish I had a secret. I, you know, I kind of approached the collectors like I approach anybody. I mean, I'm really interested in letting people tell their story. And I, I, mean, I mean, it, it doesn't matter what you do. I love to hear stories. I love people that are passionate about something. And I think the trick is, at least what works for me is, um, I'm genuinely interested in what they have to say. And I felt you'll be able to feel that when people start talking. And if you're ready to ask the next question, because we all have an agenda, right? When we interview people, we have a list of questions we want to get done. Sometimes we want to make sure we hit these. 
and we kind of forget that there's something they may have said that they want to expound on and you have to let them talk. So I tend to let them tell something. If I, if I see them really get into a story about some individual item or something that happened to them, I like to then kind of veer off and talk about that more because then they feel comfortable that I'm actually listening. And if the people think you're listening, they'll open up to you more. So I usually would start out by just having a casual conversation with, um, and just try to connect with people on other things, whether they live in Florida or they, they're from a different country or they like wine or something. Talk about something that's not about what they want to talk about, but that they find that I'm interested in everything about their lives and I really want to hear their stories. Yeah, no, that, uh, that resonates with me because you're going beyond the questions and you're, you're really um, taking stock in that person. So that makes and, sense. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> I look at the other interviews, I mean, a lot of the earlier ones, I just would watch and cringe, be cringe at my, my questions I was asking. If someone say something, and then I'd go back to like, so when's your first stamp, what stamp you bought? And I, forget, I didn't really go into what they wanted to talk about. So as the process um, evolved, I, I think I got better and better in listening more and talking less. Yeah. Well, I'll take those notes for my future interviews. Um, <laughs> so um, is there, I mean, it sounds like you talked to so many different collectors and I, I feel like from the past you told me there are some um, interviews that didn't make it, but from the ones that did, is there a specific interview from the film that you, you feel most connected with and why? Um, I, I, and I connected with everybody and I'll, I won't be too diplomatic about this. I collected everybody that I, in, in a certain way because they all brought something different to the table. I mean, Cheryl Gantz's enthusiasm really is contagious. I mean, she's so awesome and she's so excited about things. So it gets you excited. And, you know, I think that the idea of, um, you know, the storytellers that like storytelling, like George Holshower, I mean, no, very few people can tell a story like he can. Everything that came out of his mouth was gold. I mean, I had so much, I had to really at a hard time narrow it down to fit within the the, like weaving it within the constraints of the story, the parameters of the story. Um, but I do think that Doug Weiss uh, really hit home because he was one of the few people that I talked to that showed the anxiety of the, the current situation in our country and how we're a little bit falling apart as a community and how that there's no social clubs anymore. There's no, I mean, there's Kiwanis, but people don't go bowling on teams as much as they used to. And that really hit home when he started talking about how we need more community. And one thing that does that is, is collectibles and especially stamps because that led into a few other people like Cheryl Gods and Ian Gibson Smith who would say, it doesn't matter where you come from or who you are or how you identify as yourself, yourself but that you actually are able to um, come together on a, like a common love. And that was a big thing. So I think Doug really did a really, I watched his interview over and over again and that really affected me, especially you know, in our current situation.